Okay, everyone, we're up to past 100 now. Um, so I think we can get started since we're running past five o'clock. So good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Brathwaite, and I am the immediate past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados, um, ICAB. On behalf of ICAB, I'm pleased to welcome you to this web webinar Understanding Credit Union Financial Statements, which is part of our public financial literacy series. ICAB is pleased on this occasion to partner with the Barbados Cooperative Credit Union League and the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions. And we thank both organizations for their support and for the support of their member credit unions. Someone is saying that they have to leave at 5.25 p.m. Yes, the webinar will be recorded and will be available on demand um, afterwards. So we're using Zoom webinars for this um, today's presentation. Those of you who are not familiar with, with Zoom webinar, if you have a look at the screen, look at the bottom, you can see um, this is given a visual of what your own screen should look like. So at the bottom, you see the chat bubble. So you can click on that bubble and chat with other participants. Um, you can raise your hand if you want to address the, the gathering, although um, we probably would not be using that feature today. And then there's a QA and a um, feature. If you want to ask a question, you type it in the Q&A um, box and I'll answer it. So if you tick on Q&A, this little box will come up. Type your question in. You can send anonymously if you want, um, but you don't have to. And then click on send, and I'll see it, and I'll be able to, to respond. So this shows another view of that panel. Um, but more importantly, if you are having any technical challenges, um, you can email the ICAB secretariat, so lisa.dennybrathwit at icab.bb, and her WhatsApp information is on the screen. And as I mentioned before, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on demand um, afterwards. So again, if you're having any technical challenges, the contact information for assistance is on the screen. Other than that, if you have any comments for your fellow participants, you can put those in the chat. If you specifically want to ask me a question, then you can put that in the Q&A box. Um, and you're encouraged as I go through the, the material, you can feel free to ask me any questions at any time. So I'm going to turn off my webcam at this moment. Um, and then we're going to have our first of a series of polls um, to help you keep you engaged, of course, and to get um, a bit of information from you that will be re relevant to the presentation. So I'm going to launch the first poll and it should come up on your screen. And you can select the your appropriate response and then we'll have a look at the results. And we have quite a few people asking me where is St. Lucia, and you're quite correct. So my apologies. Um, I did omit a few of them, but, oh, no, what I did was there should be an option for OECS. So that's what's missing 
should be an OECS option. So my apologies. So um, type it in the chat, please. So I see one, one from St. Lucia, one from St. Kitts, another St. Lucia, two St. Lucia, one from Antigua. My sincerest apologies. Um, OECS was meant to be in that list. So please forgive me. See St. Vincent. So OECS folks, put it in the chat, please, so we can see. So let's see what we have. St. Kitts, St. Vincent, Trinidad, OECS, Antigua. So lots from St. Lucia, Dominica, Grenada. Oh, I'm really disappointed because I wanted to track the um, all of the particip participation. So I'm being told that some of you have your hands raised, but I am not seeing, see three participants have their hands raised. Orlando, Annette, Tamara, do you guys wanna speak? Were you just telling me that OECS is missing? So let me go to Orlando. Orlando, did you wanna speak? I've unmuted, unmuted you. No, I don't want to speak, just indicating that I was on. Okay, thank you. Annette, did you want to speak? Okay, maybe not. Sorry, are you there right now? Yes. Okay, I was just asking for St. Lucia. Uh, right, apologies for that. Okay. All right, let's end this poll now. share the results. So the results are a bit skewed, 69 from Barbados, but um, 13 from Trinidad and Tobago and a large number from the OECS that are missing. So at least we know we have a, we have a wide range, one from Bahamas, one from Guyana. All right, so let's see. We had an, the second poll queued up. Aha. Let's go with the second poll. turn off my webcam again. All right, so five, 10 more seconds and then I'll end this poll and show you the results.
Right, let's end that poll and look at the results. So about 10 of you have an advanced level of understanding of financial statements, 32% um, intermediate. About half of you are would say you're a basic level and 12% are clueless. So we will try to cater for, for all levels as we go through. And of course, you can ask questions if I'm not um, covering um, what you want to know. Um, but generally, the intention or the, the target of this webinar is for those at the basic and the clueless level. Um, but we'll try to accommodate the others. So the objective is to increase participants' understanding of the purpose and element of financial statements and how to use these to analyze the financial position and financial performance of a credit union. Now, in I guess in preparing financial statements and thinking about the target audience of financial statements, um, the information is aimed at the primary users of the financial statement in this case, the members of the credit union and the financial statements are prepared with an expectation that those primary users have a reasonable knowledge of business and of credit union activities and that they will analyze the financial statements diligently and not just give a cursory read. So some analysis and study of the financial statements is required. And there is an assumption that you are familiar with the basic financial statement conventions and jargon. If you're thinking that you don't have this knowledge base, then be prepared to put in a bit of time and effort to get there. But it is probably not as difficult as it might seem at, at first glance. These are the main components of a complete set of financial statements. And hopefully many of you are already familiar with these components. The statement of financial position is more commonly known as the balance sheet, but it really does show the financial position of the credit union at a point in time. The statement of profit and loss, also known as the income statement, shows the financial performance of the credit union over a period of time. So the first one shows the financial position, while the second one shows the financial performance. There's also a statement which shows certain transactions with the owners of the credit union, the members, and this statement is a statement of changes in equity. And it shows transactions with owners where these are not considered part of the financial performance of the credit union. For example, issuance or repayment of shares. So those are transactions with members, but they're not considered um, representative of the financial performance of the credit union. We will spend uh, most of our time this evening looking in detail at the first two statements on the list and a bit of time looking at the third. The statement of cash flows, as the name suggests, shows the actual cash flows of the credit union, as this may be important information and is not explicitly shown in the other two statements. And finally, the notes to the financial statements provide detailed information about the items included in the other statements, as well as what we are what are referred to as the accounting policies of the credit union. We will be referring to both of these later in the session, but not in a lot of detail, given given time constraints. Um, Somebody is asking, will the video be be shared? The session is being recorded um, and it will be available on demand afterwards. The auditor's report, of course, is a very important because the auditor is giving credit union members assurance that the information in the financial statements is not materially misstated. Not that the information is 100% correct, 
but that there are no errors that are significant enough to make a difference to decisions made on the basis of the financial statement. So users of the financial statements, credit union members are making decisions on the basis of these financial statements. If something in the view of the auditor would make a difference to the decision of the credit union uh, member or user of the financial statements, then that is considered material. The wording on the, of the paragraph shown on this slide, which is the second paragraph in the audit report, confirms that no material errors were found by the, by the auditor. If the auditor did find material errors, then this paragraph would first of all be titled qualified opinion, because then the auditor would be saying the, the, their report was qualified. And then it might read something like, in our opinion, except for the effects of such and such a thing, the accompanying financial statements um, present fairly. So you would see that except for in a qualified opinion. You may also in the current environment be seeing a paragraph in the auditor's report drawing attention to the actual or potential impact of COVID-19 on the financial statements of the credit union. So the auditor may draw attention, for example, to significant uncertainty about how COVID-19 might affect the credit union in future, especially, for instance, the ability of members to repay loans from the credit union. So here's an example of a statement of financial position or balance sheet for a credit union. The statement shows the credit union's assets, so what it owns, as well as the credit union's liabilities, what it owes. So typical approach to reading this statement would be to compare the financial position at the end of the current year, June 30th, 2020, to the financial position at the end of the previous financial year. So you hopefully you're seeing my mouse now on the screen. Yes. So the end of the current year, June 2020, end of the previous financial year, June 2019. And in doing that comparison, you would look for any significant variances and then refer to one of the other statements or to the notes of the financial statements to see if any unusual fluctuations can be explained. So if we look at this particular balance sheet, cash increased by about 400,000. So we have a statement of cash flows that might give you or that will give you detail um, about these, in, about that increase. You will note that deposits increased by about 500,000. So the credit union got about 500 more in deposits and about 400,000 of that is still in cash. Um, so the credit union has not yet been able to use that cash to increase its loans to members or its investments. And in fact, investments declined about 200,000. Um, there should be a note to the financial statements that gives detail about what is included in that um, line item investments. And you may be able to see um, to get a better understanding of why that decrease occurred. And then you see long-term debt decrease, also decreased by about 200,000. So again, some of the cash that the credit union got from the, the deposits apparently um, was used to repay that long-term debt. The lines for other assets and other liabilities don't give us much information. So hopefully you would have a note to the financial statements that give a further breakdown or explanation of what is included in those line items. The notes, of course, would be referenced on the statement of financial position, which I haven't done for this example. Um, but there would be a reference to the note, so you can turn to that note and see the explanation. The other category on the balance sheet is members equity, which is very important for the credit union. This category includes shares issued to members, so share capital, um, along with reserves and retained earnings. And we will discuss this category in a bit more detail shortly.
This example continues with the statement of profit or loss or the income statement, which shows the financial performance of the credit union over the year or for the year ended June 30th, 2020, with comparative information for the year ended June 30th, 2019. So as you can see, unfortunately, interest income decreased, but interest expense also decreased. So that net interest income, which is the difference between those two line items actually increased. The fact that interest expense decreased is interesting because we saw on the balance sheet that deposits increased and deposits most likely account for the majority of interest expense. So you might have expected um, interest expense to increase as well. Um, there may be reasons why it did not, good reasons, um, but as well remember that the long-term loan balance also decreased, which would result in lower interest expense. The impairment expense relates to losses expected on loans to members, which we will speak about um, later on. And then operating expenses would usually be shown in more detail on this statement or included in a separate note. But the main components would be such things as salaries and wages, rent, electricity, technology costs, and marketing. The various expenses are subtracted from the interest income and other income to give the net income or profit for the year. In this case, 116,981. On the other hand, if the credit union's expenses were greater than its income, then the figure at the bottom would be a negative number and the credit union would have incurred a loss for the year. Let's see, I think I have a question. What does the reserves on the members' equity represent? We will come to that shortly. So if I don't cover it um, fully, you can, you can um, prompt me there again and ask me about it. All right, so on to our next poll. All right, there it goes. All right, just a few more seconds and we'll close this one. Right, so let's have a look at this one. The question was who decides 
what accounting rules are used by a credit union in preparing its financial statements. Um, this was a bit of a trick question because the most appropriate answer is probably not one of those options. So typically, um, there will be legislation that says what accounting rules the credit union can use. So you would have the cooperatives legislation or other legislation governing, finance, um, governing financial reporting by credit unions. That legislation may either specify the accounting rules or the accounting standards that the credit union must use, or it may delegate that responsibility. Um, so I know in some jurisdictions in the region, it would it might say accounting um, standards approved by the, the local Institute of Chartered Accountants. Um, I am not sure if there are jurisdictions where that authority is dedicated to the regulator, the credit credit union regulator in our region, but certainly internationally, um, credit union regulators do have that power. Um, the international body that sets financial reporting standards, um, I would say, would never have that ability to say what rules a credit union must use. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's no international body that has set rules specifically for credit unions, nor would they have the power to say that a credit union in this region or any particular region must use their standards. Um, World Council of Credit Unions, no, they don't determine what, well, what accounting rules are perhaps, I should have said financial reporting rules. So WAKU doesn't determine that. So the answer I was looking for, which is now on the slide, would be it is fixed in legislation, but then that legislation may give the power to the local Institute of Credit Accountants or perhaps the local credit union regulator. Um, any comments about that or questions? You can you can put them in the chat or in the questions. Hopefully there is no serious disagreement with that uh, position that I put forward. So let's take down that poll and move on. All right, so these are examples of um, what I was referring to as the rules for preparing financial statements. So they're very, as some of you already know, they're actually very detailed rules or standards which accountants must follow in preparing financial statements. These are sometimes referred to as generally accepted accounting principles and larger jurisdictions have their own version of these standards. Companies and organizations in our region, however, typically use international financial reporting standards, which are published by a body called the International Accounting Standards Board. So that's probably the international body that um, you were thinking about in the poll in question. As a result of the complexity of these standards, um, the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB, has also published a simplified version of the standards uh, which are called International Financial Reporting Standards for Small and Medium-Sized Entities. And this has attracted the attention of regional credit unions, many of which find full IFRS, as we call it, too complex and too burdensome and would prefer to use the IFRS for SMEs. Full IFRS, by the way, is published in three volumes, as so shown on the slide which span 5,120 pages in total, while the IFRS for SMEs is about 450 pages in two volumes. Unfortunately, the IFRS for SMEs may only be used by entities that are not publicly accountable, and credit unions generally are considered publicly accountable as defined in the IFRS for SMEs, since they hold deposits for broad range of members for a broad range of members. So credit unions would normally not be permitted to use this simplified standard. However, I thought it would be useful to include on this slide reference to FRS 102, which is based on the IFRS for SMEs and is used in the United Kingdom and Ireland. In those countries, the, regular, the relevant regulators have permitted credit unions to use this simplified standard on the basis that the cost of using full IFRS far exceed its benefits. 
food for thought, hopefully, for us in the region, um, because we have not generally yet permitted our credit unions to use the simplified standard. Hey, um, Andrew. Sure, Lisa, go ahead. Um, we have two attendees who have their hands raised. Okay. Um, if you can go ahead and unmute them. Hi, Shelly Hunt, you're unmuted. You, you can speak. No. Okay, we'll go to Otley Cox Burrows. Otley, do you have a question? Um, no, and Hygiena Rochford, you can ask your question if you have a question. Very, very low. I need to hear louder, please. I was saying, Mr. Braffitt, louder. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, Andrew, you can continue. Okay, thanks, Lisa. So this, this, the graphic on this slide I thought was interesting. Um, so I reproduced it here um, for you. So it shows the sources of funds of the credit union. So over here, those sources are, of funds are either, either liabilities. So the deposits are liabilities. You have other liabilities or your capital. Capital is not a liability, but it, it is a source of funds. Um, so we have it on this side. So the credit union gets funds from deposits, other liabilities and capital, and then it uses those funds to make loans, to make investments, um, to hold as cash, or to acquire other assets. Those deposits are interest bearing. The capital doesn't have a fixed rate of return, but um, a return is paid on the share capital in the form of dividends to members, but that will be at the discretion of the credit union. So it is not a fixed cost. And then the other liabilities, there is no cost. So that's non-interest bearing. So you have interest bearing deposits and you're trying to earn enough interest to cover that interest expense on the deposits as well as cover all your operating expenses. So the income statement, the statement of profit and loss shows that comparison. But back over here, so the loans on the on the asset side now, you have earning assets and non-earning assets. So your loans to members are earning assets. The investments would be earning a return for the credit union. But then you have non-earning assets. So the cash, um, which may be non-interest earning or earning a very low interest. And then your other assets are not generating income for the credit union. So I thought this was an interesting um, comparison. You can see on this slide that this box with the assets is equal, the size of this box is equal to the size of this box with the liabilities um, and capital. And then similarly, so that would be the statement of financial position or the balance sheet. And then similarly for the statement of profit and loss, you have revenue comprising mainly loan interest income. This little box at the top should say other income. So that accounts for all of the revenue of the credit union. So all the inflow of cash um, that relates to the operating, the, the financial performance of the credit union. And then over here would be the expenses, which should include, well, the expenses. So you have the revenue, then you have operating expenses, loan impairment, the loan interest expense. We saw all of those on the statement of profit and loss. But then this little difference here is the net income. So whatever is left over, 
represents the earnings of the credit union. So all of that should be viewed in this in the context of this statement from Waku. A credit union has an effective financial structure when assets financed by savings deposits generate sufficient income to pay market rates on savings, cover operating costs, and maintain capital adequacy. So hopefully this um, little graphic helps to explain or illustrate that statement from Waku. Uh, we will speak a little bit about the capital adequacy shortly. I see somebody has a hand raised. Lisa, could you, let me stay on that slide. Two participants with hands, hands raised. Um, Lawanda Alkins, you can unmute yourself. Good evening. I was asking if the reason for the deposits being um, under the liabilities label um, is because if a, that a person can withdraw all of their savings if they choose to do so, if that is why it's on the liabilities. Exactly. So let me, I can, I can explain something else that I was going to explain later on, but let me do that now. So <laughs> typically credit union members would have deposits in the credit union as well as shares, correct? So yes. you can split your you, the money that you put in. Some of it can be shares. Some of it can be deposits. The, the deposits, you would earn a fixed rate of interest on those deposits um, as determined by the credit union. Um, the shares, the credit union would pay dividends on those shares at a rate determined at the end of the year. Now, the question is, um, the deposits are clearly liabilities because the member can come at any time and ask for their their money back, their deposits back. They can withdraw the deposits at any time. So it is a liability of the credit union. But what about the shares? So this issue arose um, several years ago after some guidance was issued on a, finan a particular financial reporting standard, IAS 32. So that is a standard under international financial reporting standards that deals with the presentation of um, what we call equity, liabilities and equity. So that the guidance from IAS 32 said that if members have shares that they can come and withdraw at any point in time and the credit union cannot refuse that withdrawal, then those shares are in effect liabilities. So those shares should also be classified as liabilities in the credit union's financial statements. So up to that point, most or all credit unions showed all of their shares in equity and they only showed the deposits as a liability. But after that guidance on IIS 32, credit unions then um, had to start classifying members' shares as liabilities um, since then, we've had some changes to legislation and credit union bylaws where members now have qualifying shares. So those shares cannot be withdrawn unless the member um, no longer wants to be a member of the credit union. And those shares can remain as equity, but all other shares being shares that can be withdrawn on demand by the member must be classified as liabilities in the balance sheet, in the statement of financial position of the of the credit union. So hopefully that answered your question as well as clarified it for others. Yes, thank you. Was that the last one, Lisa? Um, no, Orlando Aline has a question. Orlando, your hand is raised. Do you have a question or? Okay, maybe he doesn't. Maybe, yeah. Okay, can so we go please? on. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can now hear you. Yes. Uh, good evening, Andrew, and good evening, all. Um, I was just evening. trying to understand 
the further explanation for the net income and the expenses. I, I know you, you didn't mention something about it, but I'm not clear because under, under the expenses, you have operating expenses, loan impairment, loan interest expense. Uh, explain to me again the way the net income is mentioned under expenses. It's, it's, not, it's not really an expense. It's just um, kind of the, the, the way the chart is designed. So in the same way that over here, capital is not a liability. But we put it in here to so that these two boxes would be the same size. Over here, net income is not an expense, but we just included it so that you would see the revenue. This, the revenue is equal to the sum of all of these expenses plus the net income. Okay, thank you. Understand? Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I agree. It's a little confusing, but um, <laughs> apart from that, I think it is a neat kind of a neat graphic. Okay, thank you. I can follow. Right. Thank you. So let's go on. So let's talk about pearls. Pearls is a financial performance monitoring system designed to offer management guidance for credit unions and other savings institutions. Pearls is a set of 44 financial ratios or indicators that allow an analysis of the financial condition and the financial performance of any financial institution. Each indicator has a prudential target um, goal or a standard of excellence, which was developed by the World Council of Credit Unions, WACU, based on its experience working to strengthen and modernize credit unions and promote savings-based growth. According to WACU, depositors can have confidence that savings institutions or credit unions that meet the standards of excellence under pearls are safe and sound. So those 44 financial ratios are grouped um, based on the acronym pearls. So P, protection. There's some ratios under protection. There's some under effective financial structure, asset quality, rates of return and costs, liquidity, and signs of growth. So we will touch on just some of those as we as we go through, um, but just bear in mind that we have this this tool called Pearls for financial analysis of the performance and financial position of credit unions. So on that note, now let's go to our next poll. Um, Andrew Orlando Alien has his hand raised again, so I believe he has another okay. question. Orlando, do you have a question? Okay, maybe he does not. I'm gonna lower your hand, Orlando. All right, let's end this poll now and see the results. So 57% of you are already familiar with familiar with pearls um, and 34% of you uh, don't know. So the if the credit union is using pearls um, and comparing their performance to pearls, then it may be in the financial 
statements themselves, any notes of the financial statements, but most likely it would be in the annual report or narrative that um, accompanies the financial statement. So if you're unsure about that, then you can check um, if your credit union publishes an annual report, um, read through and see if there's reference to pearls or comparison to, to benchmarks. So let's talk about members equity and I did have some questions um, any question panel on this so if I don't cover those then be sure to, to remind me before I go on. So the members equity as a reminder from that example statement of financial position we were looking at will be this section that is highlighted on the slide so it comprises share capital reserves and retain earnings. So let me deal with the, the questions now. One was about reserves. So what are reserves? So I guess the main reserve um, that would be included in equity would be typically credit unions have a requirement to transfer amounts every year out of profit into um, reserves. Um, the objective of that is to help um, build and maintain the capital of the credit union and we'll see very shortly why that is so important. Um, then somebody asked a question about other comprehensive income. So that other comprehensive income would also be included in reserves. So I guess there are a lot of things that are recorded in the income statement so revenues expenses gains and losses so for example if you if the credit union sells an asset um, and it sells it for more than what it is recorded at on the balance sheet so you have property and equipment in this example 368,000. if the credit union sells that property and equipment in its entirety for more than 368,000, then the excess gets recorded as a gain and that gain goes through the income statement and it goes into profit for the year and then into retained earnings as you will see later on. However, under international financial reporting standards, there are certain um, gains or losses that the standards say must go directly to equity. So they do not go through the statement of profit and loss they go directly to equity and those are um, classified or considered as other comprehensive income. So for example, um, it may apply to certain investments where the standard says gains on those investments, not from sale, but from carrying those investments at market value are taken directly to um, equity. So that would be other comprehensive income. And we'll see an example that includes that, that later on. So those reserves could be the capital reserves that are required by regulation. It could be this other comprehensive income, but then credit unions also tend to have reserves um, for different purposes where they're setting aside funds, like you may have an education fund or some other fund and that gets, um, included or a separate reserve is set up in equity uh, for that. All right, so to help illustrate the point about the importance of capital and equity, let's look at our next poll. So, which credit union would you feel safest depositing your money with? So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it um, because the slide is going to disappear when I pull up the poll and the poll just has A, B, C or not sure. So think about it a little bit. Which credit union based on these figures shown on the slide, which credit union would you feel safest depositing your money with? So I'm going to launch the poll now. So think of what your response is. And here's the poll. Up 
about 45% of you have voted so far, so I'll give you some more time. For those of you who have not voted, I can say at this point, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer, but what is your personal view? So how would you make that assessment? You're up to 65% have voted, creeping up. Um, I'm gonna give you 10, 15 more seconds, 71%. All right, so let's end this poll. I'll show you the results. So most of you chose option C. Um, then 25% of you chose option B. Just under that, 22% chose option A and 30% said not sure. Get rid of the poll from my screen. So as I said, I don't know that there's a right um, or wrong answer, but one way to analyze um, these different, these three credit unions and to think about your decision is to look at the ratio of equity to assets. Um, which in a sense represents, you could call it the capital ratio or the, um, it gives you a measure of the adequacy of the capital of this credit union. We'll see later on capital and members equity are not quite the same thing, um, but this, this could be used as a proxy. So credit union A, the equity of a million represents 5% of the assets of that credit union, credit union B, 25% and credit union C, credit union C, 50%. So in a sense, you can think of the equity as being a buffer that the credit union has against um, losses or poor performance in any one year or just unexpected um, occurrences. So in that sense, credit union A has a very small buffer. So a fluctuation of just 5% in those assets of 20 million could completely wipe out the equity of um, credit union A. Whereas credit union C, it would take something that, uh, that destroys 50% of the asset value um, to, to erode all of the equity of credit union C. So, I mean, you may, you may want to get some, a bit more information about the, the actual composition of the assets and the quality of the assets, but certainly if you just look at that equity ratio, then um, credit union C, although it is smaller, uh, might be viewed to be better off than credit union A. Credit union A might be viewed as being quite risky. So this slide just reproduces the information we had from the balance sheet, the breakdown of members equity. Um, this is showing you that the equity is equal to the assets minus the liabilities. So if the liabilities for whatever reason exceed the assets, then you're gonna have negative equity or put another way, um, you have negative equity if the liabilities exceed the assets. And this is a, a condition that you want to avoid at all costs because then the credit union would not have enough assets to settle its liabilities. So the minimum capital to asset ratio recommended by WACU is 10%. So WACU says that capital should be at least 10% of total asset, but, but what is capital? 
So here we're showing members equity, which includes share capital, reserves, and retained earnings. So for the purpose of that 10% um, per ratio, capital would represent the portion of equity that cannot be withdrawn by members. So if you have shares included in your equity um, that can be withdrawn on demand of members, then those are not considered capital. The portion of reserves that are required because of um, legislative requirements would be considered part of capital. So the regulator has said, you need to transfer some percentage of your income or some percentage of your total assets into this reserve. This is a permanent reserve. You can't touch it. You can't pay dividends out of it. You can't do anything with it. Then that would be considered capital. Retained earnings, on the other hand, you could pay dividends out of those retained earnings. Um, so perhaps that would not be considered permanent capital. So the capital must be permanent and non-withdrawable. So according to Waku, when crises occur in credit unions and their surrounding economies, members might withdraw their shares and savings to protect their own assets. It is during such crises that credit unions most need to rely on their capital, and they call it institutional capital, to cover losses. So because shares cannot be counted on to absorb losses at such times, they are not considered credit union capital, rather a liability. But as I said, perhaps um, in cases where you have shares that can't be withdrawn, then those may be considered capital, but the member could decide to leave the, the credit union and then get their, their shares back. So those might not be, be capital. All right, sorry about that. So we also saw retained earnings. So just so you're clear on what retained earnings are, let's look at a quick example. So let's assume you had a new credit union. So it starts with zero retained earnings. Uh, retained earnings are really cumulative earnings. So this credit union has not earned anything. It is a new credit union. It has had no income yet. So it starts with retained earnings of zero. Then in its first year of operation, it makes $100,000, pays dividends of 50. It makes it a transfer to that mandatory reserve um, required under law. So the net of all of that is 30,000. So the retained earnings at the end of the year will be 30,000. In the next year, so that, so actually there's an error in my slide because that $30,000 should then go forward but let's assume this first column ended to 50. So beginning of year two, it would have 50,000. So again, that income, it pays dividends, transfers to capital reserve, has retained earnings 75,000. So this is the cumulative earnings of the credit union, net of dividends and transfer to capital reserves or to other reserves um, and any other transactions that affect retained earnings under the relevant accounting standards. In this example, on the other hand, you have a different credit union, but again, first year starts with zero, has net income, transfer to capital reserves, dividends. So th this credit union was very aggressive in their dividends. Um, so they paid everything out. They had zero retained earnings at the end of the year. Then the next year, unfortunately, they had a loss, which puts them into a negative position in retained earnings. So a deficit. So if we go back, so if we look up here, so if instead of retained earnings here of 54, you had a negative number, that would be called a deficit. 
Now that negative number may be smaller than the sum of the share capital and reserves. So those share capital and reserves are acting as a buffer against possible losses. But you could have a situation where that deficit, so that negative number is so large that it is larger than the sum of the share capital and other reserves. And you're more likely to have that if you didn't have these reserves or if they were very low or if the share capital was very low. Remember in, in some credit unions, um, you may have nothing in, in capital because all of the shares are being classified as liabilities. So your share capital might be zero. So the only protection you have really is, is these reserves, but this might be a negative number. This might be a negative number that is so large that your total equity is negative. So you then have a member's deficiency. And if this is negative, it means that your total assets minus your total liabilities is negative, which means that your liabilities exceed your assets. So if instead of member, member's equity, you have a deficiency, if you have a negative number here, that implies that your liabilities are greater than your assets, which is something that you want to um, safeguard against. So therefore, this is why we have um, rules about um, adequacy of capital in credit unions and financial institutions and mandatory reserves that have to be set up as part of permanent capital. So if you have any questions about that, you can put them in the um, Q&A box. Um, Andrew, Hi, Veronica, Veronica Henry has um, her hand raised. OK. I'll go over the top. Um, Veronica, you can unmute yourself. Yes, good evening, all. Um, good evening. Yeah, supposing a credit union realize a deficit at the end of a year, can they pay dividends out of reserve earnings? If they have a loss for the year? Yeah. It depends on the on what the local um, credit union regulation says. So your, your credit union would be subject to um, legislation governing um, cooperatives and credit unions, or there may be guidance issued by the local credit union regulator. But I would think that um, typically, um, first of all, you'd be looking at the at the profit. So most credit unions would only be paying dividends out of profit. But um, if you wanted to go beyond that, typically you would only pay dividends if you had retained earnings. So I don't know if there are jurisdictions where a credit union would be able to go beyond that um, and pay out of reserves. So remember, you have the capital reserve, which is mandatory. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think you could pay out of that. And all the other reserves are set up for some specific purpose. Um, you may have a counting reserve, so we call it other comprehensive income. Um, but really, is not it is not an accounting question. It is a it is a legal question as to whether the credit union would be permitted to pay dividends in those circumstances, and it therefore would vary by jurisdiction. So you're saying, from an accounting standpoint, it's not allowed. The account the normally from an accounting perspective, you would be paying dividends only out of um retain earnings in theory if if your local le or legislation allowed you to pay dividends other than that um typically the accounting rules would say well when you pay that dividend credit for credit it first against any retained earnings if there are no retained earnings there then i guess you you would be creating a deficit in in equity so the accounting rules are not going to prohibit you from do it from doing it it would be the law of the land that prohibits you from doing it or the regular credit union regulations okay thank you was that it lisa um yeah 
Yes, but um, Veronica also had a question in the question panel. Right. Um, so I'm looking. I'm looking at those now. So I think I dealt with the other comprehensive income, the appropriations. Basically, that refer that just refers to um, somebody's asking me to explain appropriations and other income, other comprehensive income. So the appropriations you are transferring an amount out of retained earnings and into a particular reserve. Um, so it could be, as I said, the example I gave before, like you have an um, education reserve. So you would say you would, you're appropriating retained earnings and transferring it to that reserve. Um, another question, what, what is the difference between international reporting standards and international accounting standards? I guess both terms are used interchangeably. So we used to call it international accounting standards, but um, technically the name is international financial reporting standards, I IFRS. Um, let's see, somebody was saying option C. Can the capital reserves be listed as revaluation reserves? Um, the, your reserves would include the revaluation re reserves. So this is where you have, for example, property, plant and equipment. You revalue it periodically. If you, if you revalue that property, plant and equipment, you're carrying it at the current um, fair value or market value. So if um, that results in an increase in the carrying value. So let's say you, you got the property plan and you got the, typically it would be land and building. So you, this land and building you have on your balance sheet at a million dollars, you got it valued. The valuation says $1.5 million. So that difference of 500,000 is a revaluation reserve that gets taken directly to um, equity. So it would be included in reserves. So the que if the question is, is that considered capital? Um, according to Waku, that would not be considered capital. Um, I don't know if they're saying it, it is not permanent capital because I guess you could sell that building at any time um, and those reserves would be realized. But generally, in the individual um, jurisdiction, if there are restrictions on capital, then that jurisdiction would define what can be included in capital. So hopefully that answered your question. Otherwise, you can you can let me know in the Q and A box. How is the decision made regarding what amount goes into the reserves from the retained earnings? Um, it could be something that is determined by legislation. So the legislation would tell you how much has to be transferred. Um, other than that, like if you're setting up an education fund or some similar fund for a particular purpose, it would generally be at the discretion of the credit union. The credit union may have fixed the amount that gets transferred each year, or it may be a decision that is made at the end of the year, depending on what the, the, the profit was for that particular year. All right, so let's go back to our balance sheet now and look at the assets. Let's see what time it is, 6.12. So we're almost at 6.30. I'm gonna go um, quickly now, but uh, we might go over. So those of you who can stay on, um, then we will go over, but I'll see how much I can get in without skipping too much in the time that's, that's left. Um, should we do this poll? Let's skip this poll. So this question was about um, credit unions being insolvent. So basically the credit union is insolvent if its liabilities exceed its assets. So this is something that we touched on um, before. So I'll skip that poll in the interest in time and go on to loans to members, um, which is really the, the, the largest category on the balance sheet. Um, let me see what I wanted to say to you about um, the assets before we go there. 
So on this slide, so you see cash and cash equivalents on this slide. So we spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that this particular credit union had a lot of cash that was not earning income, which is not a good thing. So the assumption is you have the cash in the bank, the bank is paying you nothing on that cash if it is an operating account or very, very little if it is, if it is in a saving account. So what um, Waku says on the, um, on the pearls is that those non-earning liquid assets, so the cash is a liquid asset, you need cash as a liquid asset because if members want to get uh, withdraw their deposits, you must have cash. So you need to have enough cash to settle deposits as members come to withdraw them. Um, but you don't want to have too much cash because the cash is not earning you a lot of interest. So Waku says not to hold, Waku says to hold less than 1% of your total assets in those liquid assets. But Waku also suggests that you have a liquidity reserve um, of at least, or about 10% of deposits. So the first one, hold no more than 1% of total assets in non-earning liquid assets. So it didn't say that before. So if you have non-earning liquid assets, restrict that to 1% of total assets, so almost negligible. But you should have a liquidity reserve where you do get some interest, um, but those funds can be withdrawn at very short notice. And that liquidity reserve should be a, about 10% of what your deposits are because you're holding that reserve to meet deposit repayments. So let's look at loans to members. So we have two polls dealing with loans to members. Let's pull those up. You're seeing that poll, those two polls displayed now. Well, sorry, just one so far, and then I'll do the second one. I think once you answer the first one, it'll take you to the second one. Yep. All right, about 60% have voted. It's creeping up. Sixty-nine percent, seventy-one percent, five five more seconds. All right, so let's end 75%. Let's end this poll now. Look at the results. All right, so on the first question, how much do you understand about loan delinquency and its effect on the credit union's financial statements? Um, just over half of you have um, know enough to understand what is going on. And then about 30%, um, no, just a little bit. And then the second question, how familiar are you with the expected credit loss approach under IFRS 9? 13% um, very familiar, 25% somewhat familiar, 40% have heard about it, but don't understand very much. And 22% have never heard about it. So let's talk about um, loans and delinquency. And let's do that by looking at the some of the key pearls benchmarks in relation to loans. So first of all, um, that first benchmark net loans. So loans net of um, allowance for loans, which we will speak about divided by total assets between 70% and 80%. 
So Waku was saying that your loans on the balance sheet, your loans really should be the, 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 the main investment of the credit union. Most of the credit union de deposits and other funds should be going towards loans. Um, loans are most likely going to be earning the highest rate of, of interest or return for the credit union. Their loans to um, the credit union's members primarily. So you're serving the credit union members in making those, in dispersing those loans. Um, but what Waku says is that credit unions that maintain most of their total assets, so 70 to 80% of their total assets in the loan portfolio have the greatest opportunity to maximize returns on these productive assets while providing their member clients with the credit services they seek. For your particular credit union, you can do the analysis and see um, how it compares to this particular benchmark. The allowance then for loan losses. So the credit union disburses loans to members. Some of those members, for whatever reason, may not be able to repay the loans, those loans according to the, 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 the contractual repayment terms. Um, so they may be re able to re repay some, but not all of the loan. They may be able to repay it over a longer period of time than what they had initially agreed to. Um, but any of those circumstances um, would mean that the credit union is effectively going to receive less on that loan than what um, it had budgeted or contractually agreed to receive in terms of loan principal plus interest on the loan. Where that is the case, then the credit union needs to record an allowance for loan losses. So it has the loans recorded at say 100,000 on its balance sheet. It knows it's only going to collect 90,000. So it needs to record an allowance of 10,000. So the carrying value of the loans on the balance sheet are reduced to that um, 9,000 that it knows it will collect. So how does the, the credit union um, calculate that loan loss allowance. Um, this is where the IFRS 9 comes into play. So IFRS 9, IFRS 9 is a, is a new standard under International Financial Re Re Reporting Standards, IFRS, that deals with um, the calculation of this allowance for loan losses. IFRS 9 um, takes a forward-looking approach to calculating the loan loss allowance so that provisions for loan losses are recognized as early as possible. So for instance, we now have the impact of um, COVID-19. The credit union may be anticipating that over the next um, year, the next five years, the next 10 years, because members are losing their their jobs, they're losing their source, their sources of business income, et cetera. They're not going to be able to repay some portion of, of these loans. So you would look forward over the life of the loans, um, the loan book, and make an allowance accordingly. We have moved to this type of approach in the accounting standards because of the financial crisis several years ago. It, it was found that um, financial institutions had loans that they knew would eventually become bad loans, but they didn't make any allowance for those loans, um, any allowance against those loans because the loans hadn't yet uh, become bad. So in the example that I give with COVID-19, um, a member with a loan might still be the member may have lost their jobs, but they may still be making payments on that loan out of their out of their savings. But you know, some number of members have have lost their jobs. Eventually, they're not going to be able to to repay those loans unless they got they get new jobs, which is unlikely in the current environment. So you wouldn't wait for those loans to become delinquent or wait for those members to stop making payments on those loans. You would look forward and make that allowance immediately. So as a result, you, you, you're recognizing loan loss allowances or provisions as early as possible, which means losses reported in income statement are increased. Those increased 
losses, reduce net income, and therefore reduce your retained earnings, reduce your capital, and reduce the amount that is available to pay as dividends. Essentially, what it does is it forces credit unions to set aside enough capital to absorb those future losses before they actually occur. And that, in theory, is not a bad thing. However, credit unions have struggled with these expected credit loss calculations as a result of their complexity and have had to expend significant resources to implement this new approach. So, for example, expenditure on consultants, new software, training for staff, etc. So you can see, so that explains what the allowance is. However, under, under PEARLS, PEARLS, kind of, PEARLS simplifies it, so you don't have to do those detailed IFRS 9 calculations, uh, which, as I said, are very complex. What PEARLS says is your, if you have loans that are delinquent, that delinqu delinquency is over 12 months, so you have loans where the member has not paid, has not made any payments in 12 months, then you should make a 100% provision allowance for those loans. So those loans should be at zero in your statement of financial position. Whereas loans where of delinquency of one to 12 months, um, so the loans are delinquent, the member has missed the payment, um, but it is less than 12 months. So over all of those loans, the allowance should be at least 35%. And total delinquency as a percentage of your overall loan portfolio should be less than or equal to 5%. So overall, your delinquency um, should be less than 5%. Waku was saying, um, otherwise you have, you have potentially have an issue in your um, loan portfolio. Let's see. We had some questions backed up. Somebody had asked about institutional capital. Um, there is a definition of institutional capital under, under pearls and a formula to calculate it. Um, I was actually having a challenge following that formula, but um, the slide that I show, the first slide that I showed with pearls showed you, um, it was a technical publication. So you can pull down that publication from Waku's website and go into a lot of detail there about how you calculate the institutional capital. But basically, as I said, the definition of institutional capital is um, capital that is permanent capital. What is the relationship between pearls and the international accounting standard? Absolutely no relationship. So if you're preparing financial statements under international financial reporting standards, you must comply with those international financial reporting standards. Um, but having prepared the financial statements, you can then look at the, the ratios in those financial statements and compare it to the, the, the standards or the benchmarks or targets under pearls. How often do you calculate the allowance for loan losses? Um, is it monthly or at year end? Um, if you have software that, that does it, you could in theory do it um, monthly. Um, because IFRS 9 is so complex, I think most credit unions would just do it once a year. Um, the software that the credit unions are using would allow them to do it more frequently than that. So they can do it monthly, but the inputs into that software, it is difficult to get those inputs on a monthly basis. So most credit unions probably do that um, IFRS 9 calculation um, once a year. Um, the comparison to pearls though, so pearls, you can do that, you can do that as often as you as you like. You just need to know the the loan delinquency. Is that allowance for loan losses on any of the statements? Um, so good question. So on the, the the loans are presented on the statement of financial statement net of the loan allowance. So if you had gross loans of a million you had a, a loan loss allowance of 100,000 on the balance sheet or statement of financial position, you would see those loans carried at 900,000. So the net of the two. That 100,000 of allowance would have gone, would have been an expense in the income statement. So if the next year the allowance goes from 100,000 to 150,000, 
then that 50,000 increase would be an expense in the, in the statement of profit and loss or the income statement. What happens to the provisions put aside for loss when those delinquent loans are finally paid up? Um, those, if you had made a provision on a loan and it does get paid, then that would be shown as income in the income statement. So you would initially have expensed that allowance. You get to recover that um, allowance as income through the income statement. Uh, with regard to recoveries, what is, the, what is your view on the registration and re-registering of judgments? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but just thinking it through. So the credit union, a member has um, not paid their, their loan according to the contractual terms. The credit union, the loan is secured. The credit union has decided to recover on the security. Um, but I'm not sure what the question is. So maybe Denise, you can explain the, the question or, or what the issue is. So maybe there's an issue that I am not aware of is the issue whether credit unions should be um, getting judgments against their members to, to collect loans? Is that the issue? I don't know if you can explain or maybe somebody else can, can explain. With IFRS 9, are credit unions supposed to make 100% provisions for loans from the first month of the defaulted payment? Um, the answer is no. So when the loans are, when the loans default, you have to calculate what the required provision is, the required allowance, but it, it won't necessarily be 100% um, allowance. Basically, you have to estimate what, um, how much will be collected from those defaulted loans um, over the remaining life of the loans. Um, that is part of the challenge. That is very challenging to do. Um, but for example, if the loan is secured, and um, you can rep repossess and sell the security, then you know you will get um, some cash from that loan. So you only make a provision to the extent that you think you will not be able to recover um, any of that loan. If these, loan allowance, if these loans are allowance before they collapse, if the member has regained employment and started repayment, how will the allowance be canceled? Um, well, maybe answer that question. So. Um, and, and you're not necessarily doing this allowance on individual loans. You may be doing it across the entire portfolio and making an assessment of what allowance is needed. Um, so if you may, if you, at the end of one year, you think the allowance should be 100,000. At the end of the next year, you may say, well, the economy is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. The economy is recovering. So I know that members are once again going to be able to start repaying their loans, then you would actually reduce that allowance. Then Melissa was asking, and the loan agreement restated on the, yeah, so the allowance, so that continued from the previous question. So you would just adjust the allowance on the balance sheet accordingly. So if the allowance if you think the allowance needs to be lower because now the member is going to start re making repayments, you would reduce the allowance, which gives you um, a credit on the income statement. So it is not an expense, it would be income as a result. Let's see where we are for time, um, 6.32, but I'm, I, I don't mind because um, you guys obviously had a lot of questions in relation to loan allowances and IFRS 9, this really, this IFRS 9 really um, has been the most um, complicated area for credit unions in applying international financial reporting standards in many years. I know it caused a great deal of disruption um, the past several months as credit unions adopted it um, for the first time. As I, as I said, it caused credit unions to go to great expense to engage um, specialists to purchase accounting, um, to purchase software, to do these allowance calculations, to have staff train, etc. So I know it has been um, a big issue.
So let's go on quickly and look in the remaining time at investments. So what is included in credit union investments on the balance sheet, the statement of financial position. So these are examples, fixed deposits, government bonds, um, shares of publicly traded companies, shares of private companies, um, land and buildings. Um, some credit unions have by special permission um, investments in subsidiaries. Uh, we have two hands raised, Lisa. Can you unmute unmute them? You may be on mute, Lisa. Sorry, um, Richard Coggin had his hand raised, but he um, lowered it. And Orlando has had his hand raised. Okay, so Orlando doesn't, yeah. we don't think Orlando has a question. All right, let's put up this, this poll. up to 41%, so giving the rest of you a little bit more time. Seven percent, so ten ten more seconds. And while you answer those those um, this poll, I forgot that we have we do have some accountants in the audience and some that said they have advanced knowledge of um, international financial reporting standards and understanding of financial statements rather. Um, so the example that I give of the impact of COVID-19, I guess, was a bit simplified. And most of the examples are in fact um, simplified. Um, the COVID-19, I guess it is yet to be determined what the long-term impact would be. And in calculating and doing the IFRS 9 calculations, we're really looking at the long-term um, impact on loan losses. Um, so you might not necessarily see a significant impact of COVID-19 based on what you view the long-term position to be. Um, but having said that, um, certainly the, the big banks and the large financial institutions um, that I have seen um, publish their financial statements have been taking um, significant loan loss allowances as a result of um, COVID-19. All right, so let's end this poll and see the results. So generally, I think across the region, there are restrictions on credit union investments. Um, and, and I guess generally, as it pertains to credit unions, the view is that credit unions should not be permitted to invest in anything too risky because that would put members um, deposits as at risk. Um, so credit unions um, tend to have those restrictions on investments, whereas banks and other financial institutions may not have those restrictions, but they then have capital requirements that, that depend on the level of risk attached to what they've invested in. So the riskier the investments are, the more capital the banks have to have to hold.
And then the risk, um, risk that the value might decline significantly. That was number one, tied with the credit union might not earn enough from the investments. There's no right or wrong answer to that question, but it does link into um, how you read and understand the financial statements and what you look at um, as it relates to how investments are carried in the financial statements. Right, so if we look again at this list of what the typical credit union investments are, as we said, generally they're regulatory restrictions on what credit unions can invest in. So generally credit unions are restricted to the um, least risk types of investments. So fixed deposits, um, maybe government bonds, um, very few credit unions may have shares in listed traded publicly traded companies, but they may do, do so in some jurisdictions with the permission of the regulator. Um, again, shares in private companies, land and buildings, restrictions, their restrictions generally on credit unions invested in those things without um, permission of the regulator. The other big, the other, I guess, consideration to take in mind in looking at investments in the financial statements of credit unions is the carrying value. So under international financial reporting standards, the credit unions um, may have a choice of the carrying value of the investments or depending on the circumstances, they may not have a choice, but there are different um, ways in which or different values at which those investments can be carried in the on the balance sheet. So they can be carried at cost or they carry, can be carried at fair value. For those carried at cost, you would then um, consider whether there is impairment on those investments. So you had made an investment of 100,000. Are you actually gonna be able to recover 100,000? Are you gonna make a loss when you finally realize or sell that investment? If you are gonna make a loss, then the standards would require um, you to record an impairment allowance in the same way that you would do for members loans. Alternatively, if you're carrying those investments at fair value, then, then the second question would be whether changes in fair value are recorded through profit or whether change it, changes in fair value are recorded directly in equity, which as we discussed before, it is called, you will see it as other comprehensive income on the statement of profit and loss. So it wouldn't go through profit for the year or net income for the year, but it would be on that statement of comprehensive income as shown as other comprehensive income. Now those decisions about, or those requirements about the carrying value of the um, investments and changes in that carrying value have an effect on capital, profit, and dividends. So let's look at it in these slides. So let's assume um, the credit union bought 10,000 10, shares of a publicly listed company at $10 per share. So the total cost would be 100,000. So if you're carrying those shares at cost, those shares would remain at 100,000 until they're sold. And then any difference between the 100,000 and the selling price would be recorded as a gain or loss through in the income statement, so through profit. Alternatively, you could be carrying those shares at fair value. So at the end of the next year, the fair value, let's say increased 120,000, that difference of 20,000 would go to profit if they're carried at what we call fair value through profit and loss, or the third column, that increase of 20,000 should go, could go directly to reserves. So in the, in the middle one, it went to profit, the 20,000 went to profit, which as you saw flows through to retain earnings. Um, but in certain, certain circumstances, the standards would require you to take that 20,000 directly to equity. So it would not have affected your profit. Um, 
So this goes back to the question then, can you pay dividends out of those reserves? Um, so typically the answer would be no. Um, but in this case, if you look at the comparison where you had it fair value through profit and loss, that 20,000 went to retain earnings. So you could pay dividends on that. Whereas in the third example, you couldn't. Um, so maybe an, an, a, a case could be made to the regulator that you sh could be able to, you should be able to, or permitted to pay dividends out of that reserve. However, um, certainly for companies in, in many jurisdictions, there are restrictions against paying dividends out of unrealized earnings. So in this case, um, that 20,000 would be unrealized you haven't converted it to cash yet. It is basically a, a book entry, an accounting entry. So is it reasonable or prudent to pay that out as dividends? So in a lot of jurisdictions, the answer would be no as it applies to companies. Um, and perhaps there are similar restrictions um, with respect to credit unions. But in any event, the credit unions have restrictions on, how, on what level of investments um, they can hold um, that you would be able to carry at fair value. So this um, would have limited uh, impact on most credit unions. This example um, goes through the same scenario, but in this case, the value of the shares decline at the next year end. So as I, as I said initially, if you're carrying the shares at cost, you would still um, consider potential impairment. So in this case, the fact that the carrying value has declined could be taken as an indicator that these shares, the value of these shares are impaired. So we assume that that impairment expense is recorded um, in the income statement, flows through to profit, um, and then reduces. So it reduces your profit for the year or creates a loss, and it also reduces retained earnings. So it reduces what you have available to pay as dividends, it reduces your overall capital. Um, similarly, in the second example, where the change in fair value goes to profit. So in this case, you're not recording impairment, you're recording that change in fair value. The effect is the same. And then the third one, fair value through other comprehensive income. So that line I have is incorrect, so it doesn't affect profit or loss, it goes directly to reserves. So apologies if that was explanation was quick. Um, and some of you may have been a bit lost, but I think some of you, based on the questions you were you were asking before, especially if you were accounting or accountants or involved in the finance fu function in credit unions, um, you may that should make a bit more sense to you. Um, but basically, in terms of investments, what you're looking at and trying to understand in the financial statements is, are the investments carried at cost or are they carried at fair value? And if they're carried at fair value, are changes in fair value going through profit or loss for the year or are changes in fair value going directly to reserves in members' equity? That has an effect. Um, on potentially on the capital of the credit union and on the retained earnings and the ability to pay to pay dividends. Finally, the last section we saw on the balance sheet was the liabilities. Um, the main area of interest here is with respect to the deposits. Um, cost to the credit union of, of, so you see deposits, you see long-term debt, you see other. The cost to the credit union of long-term debt is usually higher than the cost of members' deposits. So Pearl suggests that external debt should be less than 5% of total assets. So if your credit union is permitted to borrow um, from, from a bank, for example, Pearl suggests that you limit that to 5% of total assets while deposits should be between 70 and 80 percent of total assets. The other key point we had mentioned there before was that those deposits on the balance sheet may actually include something called shares from the perspective of the credit union, but they're shares that are withdrawable 
by the member and therefore they're classified as deposits. And in those circumstances, the credit union would still declare and pay dividends on those shares. But since they're included as deposits for financial reporting purposes, the dividends would be included in interest expense in the statement of profit and loss. So for those of you who are interested in those um, pearls indicators, I have included it on this slide. I'm not going to go through that in detail um, because that's a little beyond the scope of this session, which is really an introductory session, but um, you have it there. I think the intention is to distribute the slide, so you will have it on the, on the slide. And as I said, the recording will be available on demand um, afterwards. And hopefully most of the terms now um, on this slide make a little bit more sense if you didn't have that um, extent of knowledge at the beginning of this of this webinar. And hopefully you can see the reasons for these particular um, ratios and these particular comparisons. So that was all that I had for this, this evening. It is now 6.49, so we've gone a bit over the time. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully that was was interesting and useful. Are there any final questions before we go? Um, okay, so we got a question about um, registrants who were unable to attend the session this evening. So for those registrants, we will also send the um, link to the video on demand. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to let um, everyone know if they have friends who were not able to attend, they will still have access um, to the video. All right, in terms of the other questions, somebody is asking, um, Given how credit unions in Barbados were affected by the restructuring, can we still consider government bonds as a safe investment and what can be a better alternative? So I would think it was not just Barbados that was affected by this. So other jurisdictions have seen um, restructuring of government bonds. Um, so I guess in terms of the, the, the hierarchy of investments where credit unions might be um, permitted to invest in low risk, instruments. Um, the question is, should government bonds now be considered um, high risk? Um, I will leave that question for the various credit union regulators in the region to, to answer, but I would think it would be a bold credit union regulator that would say government bonds are risky, therefore we will reduce the um, percentage of assets or um, that credit unions can invest in government bonds or make it more difficult for credit unions to invest in government bonds. Then there was a question about examples of the kind of software used for IFRS 9. Um, there, I, um, I've come across a couple, none of the names are coming to mind at the moment, but um, I know in Jamaica in particular, there are a lot of um, companies that were producing software so perhaps you have contacts with the with the league in Jamaica or the or the credit unions in Jamaica, um, Trinidad. There were there were a number. Um, the Triple CU was actually um, promoting a particular software solution. So Triple CU might be able to give us some. Um, they may have information that you can get. Um, I know in Barbados the league had. Um, come up with a solution that it put to the um, credit, the smaller credit unions and the, the smaller credit unions um, banded together to, to get that particular solution. Um, so depending on which country you're in, there may be local solutions available through the credit union league or that other credit unions are familiar with, but definitely Triple CU um, has a solution that they were recommending to credit unions. Anything else, Lisa? Did we get everything? 
Um, I see something flashing. Is that a hand? Um, I think. Well, that's a chat coming in the chat. Yes, um, I think Hygiene Rochford has a question. Hygiene, yeah, okay. Do you have yes, a question? Um, good evening, everyone. I didn't hear what was said in response to the question where the person registered and uh, was unable to attend due to oh. unforeseen circumstances. You were not loud enough, so I have not heard what you said. Oh, sorry. Um, I said that um, the email with the link to the um, video on demand will be sent to registrants and attendees. So it does not matter whether you attended or not. Uh, okay. Once you registered, you will receive the link. So there'll be a link and then you indicate whether you want it. That's what you're saying? Um, there will be a link to, for you to access the, the video. Oh, access, it. Oh, access, access it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll convey the message. Thanks. All right. No problem. All right. And it will also be available on demand. So, so even if somebody did not register and you want to share it with other people in your um, credit union, then the link, you can share the link and they'll be able to, to view the video on demand. I think they will still have to register. So the original registration link should still work. And the link that will be sent, um, we can see if we can set it up so that that link works as well, even if you didn't initially register for this session. Okay, so that seems to be it. Um, so thank you very much. So look out for that link um, from us. And hopefully that was very useful and informative, as I said. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and good evening to you. All the best.